This video is brought to you by my official Discord server. We just launched it. There's a nice little hidden secret for you to try to solve once you get here. Shit, said too much. If you're interested in anything cybersecurity or just a generally cool place to hang out, consider joining the Academy. Infinite shout outs to Lil Skeleton. Oh, Lil Skelly, I couldn't have done this without you. And so thank you so much. And if you decide to join, thank you. You, you won't regret it. Happy late New Year's everyone. Let's start off this brand new year on a good note by shitting on idiots. Bob and Alice are assholes. They've been airing their dirty laundry out in public and anyone with the will to do so could easily just intercept their extremely <clears throat> personal items. Now they're not completely oblivious, they know what they're doing and I think they even feed off of it. However, Jane isn't like those two degenerates. Jane values her privacy and she wants to make sure that her private stuff stays private. But how? Jane knows that there are encryption methods out there, but which one should she pick? The older stuff is pretty much useless. A Caesar cipher, although a valid encryption method, is ridiculously easy to decrypt. You know, just because it's valid doesn't mean it isn't just completely useless. For the time, it was great. In modern times, it's practically telling the world that you have something to hide and even worse, that it's trivial to decrypt it. Hmm, Jane thinks. What about our essay? Uh, to that, Jane, I say, never in your life ever disrespect the revest, revest, revest? <laughs> Shamir Edelman, Adelman, crypto system, dude, what the f but okay, let's do a video on RSA. Okay, nerds, make sure that you can discern the difference between encryption and hashing. Not really relevant to this video, but it makes me want to peel my skin off when I see these terms flung around and interchanged as if this is some sort of back alley, decrepit, foreign currency exchange boof. Listen up, encryption. Okay, encryption is used so that you can encode a message or piece of data using keys only to have it eventually decoded later on. It's reversible. Hashing, on the other hand, you bastards, is used as a one-way system. If you hash something, you never want to see it dehashed or decrypted. Hashing isn't reversible, or at least it shouldn't ever be. Okay, with that out of the way, let's move on. Well, what the f*** is RSA anyways? What? You don't know? What are you, uh, <laughs> a sysadmin from Alibaba? Look, shh, look closely. You see that? That lock? That lock is making it so that you're not cosplaying Bob and Alice those relentless heathens. Instead, this means that your connection to the site you are on is secure, and most sites use a combination of RSA in their encryption. So RSA is a really huge deal. It means that your connection to the site is being encrypted and decrypted with an encryption algorithm. RSA is one of those algorithms. Actually, it's one of the most widely used encryption algorithms, but typically it's a reason why you can surf the site without having all of your passwords stolen or intercepted by some next man in the middle. RSA is what's known as an asymmetric encryption algorithm. Asymmetric means that it uses two different keys for encryption and decryption. These keys are called the public key and the private key. Let's assume that Jane has a friend named Gilga. <laughs> Let's assume that Jane has a friend named Gilgamesh, the Slayer of Worlds. She wants to confess her love to Gilgamesh, the Slayer of Worlds, but unfortunately in her town, anyone confessing their love to someone is immediately executed. Jane knows the enforcers of this tyrannic regime are somewhat capable of deciphering messages, so she can't just use something as simple as a rotation cipher. So instead, she decides to use old reliable, aka RSA encryption. Remember the part about asymmetry and how there are two different keys for encryption and decryption? Jane has a set of keys and so does her love interest, Gilgamesh, Slayer of Worlds. She has a private key and a public key. And so does this dweeb. Say you have a message you want to send. You would sign or encrypt the message with that person's public key. And since they have the corresponding private key, which only they own, when they get the encrypted message, they can decrypt it and read it. In other words, imagine you have a box. This box is sealed with a lock that everyone can see. It's your public key. And when you eventually get this box, you can open it. You can use your private key, which no one should have access to. So it's solely yours. This is how the RSA algorithm works. We start off with two large prime numbers. Let's call them P and Q. Remember that these are numbers that are greater than one and don't have any other divisors other than one and itself. For example, two, three, five, seven, and 11 are prime numbers. Aside from one and themselves, they have no divisors. Numbers like four, six, eight, and nine aren't. I'll choose small ones for the sake of demonstration. So let P equal two and Q equal seven. Very simple so far. So next step, we need to calculate the product of these two large primes, okay? Let's let our value N hold this product, okay? So N is equal to P times Q. In our case, it's two two times seven, which is just 14. This value is gonna be present within both of the public and private keys, as we'll soon see. This va this n value is going to be used as the modulus. God damn. This n value is going to be used as the modulus in the algorithm. It will determine the size of the keys and the size of the messages that can be encrypted and decrypted in the RSA. I'll go get them. The larger the value of n, the stronger the encryption and the more secure the messages will be. Step three. Now we need to calculate the Euler totient function, which is the funny looking, um, is it phi? The phi? Hold on, let me just ask my Greek friend. 
Okay, so it's a uh, V, Phi, oh fuck, I still don't know. I'm gonna just call it V. We do this in order to choose a public exponent, in other words, the positive integer that we'll use to encrypt our love letter. I mean, <laughs> encrypt Jane's love letter to Gilgamesh. Slayer of world. Let's call it E and define E such that E is greater than one, but less than the Euler totient. Also, we need to make sure that E is relatively prime or co-prime to phi of n. This is just fancy nerd speak for two numbers that only share a greatest common divisor or GCD and that GCD is one, which can be denoted in the following way. This function, by the way, is so fucking cool. It pretty much tells you how many positive integers from one to your number are co-prime to your number. So in this case, the Euler totient of our value n, which is 14, once we do all the math and everything, it tells us that there are six integers that are co-primed to 14. And moreover, in the case of 14, we can see that these six primes are 1, 3, 5, 9, 11, and 13. It's not so cool to have a function give you that much information about a number. Step four, now we need to choose a public exponent such that it follows those conditionary bounds that we talked about earlier. Or E is an element of the set of one to two to blah, 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 all the way up to our Euler totient minus one, such that the greatest common divisor between our public exponent and the Euler totient is one. So from all those co-prime numbers that we got from the Euler totient, we can start canceling out shit that doesn't fit into this conditionary bound, okay? So like we can't choose one, which is out of there. We can't choose anything higher than six because remember that E has to be smaller than the Euler totient itself, which is six. So that leaves us with five. A thing to note, is that sure you can use a public exponent that's closer to the value of n, in other words, a bigger exponent, but it would result in slower encryption times and decryption times. But it does make it more difficult to decode due to the fact that it's more difficult to factorize number into its prime factors. So it's a bit of a trade-off between efficiency and security. Conversely, having a smaller e could also result in faster encryption and decryption, but it also makes it easier for an attacker to factorize, potentially compromise the entire thing. Step five. Now, this part is really fucking like a lot of people get tripped up here but step five is we need to calculate our private exponent which is this right e times d mod of euler totient is equal to one which means that we are trying to find a number when we times it with the public exponent and divide it by the euler totient the result is one so this is going to make up the value of our private key we already found our public key which is a pair e n or 514. How are we going to do this you might ask? There can be a lot of these numbers. So here's what we're going to try to figure out. d times 5 mod of 6 is equal to 1 in our case. So all we need to do is find a number where when we divide it by 6 we just get 1 as a remainder. We can figure this all out by using the extended Euclidean algorithm. <laughs> sure let me just do that real quick. Okay. Mm, I'll use 11. Now we have the private key D equals 1114. Also now we can start encoding and decoding messages. Jane, God bless her soul, can finally start to confess her love to Mish Gilga, Worlds of Slayer. Let's just assume that Jane is the one who gets to encode the message. Okay, here's how we actually encode a message. Sure, we could use ASCII codes and encode them, but another way is to just set up the corresponding numbers to an alphabetical character, which is just assigning a letter, a numerical value, right? And we can do that from one all the way to the blah, blah, blah. And, and and once we have the letter that we want to send to the person, we could convert that into its numerical form and then encode that number. Also note that the message, let's call it M, has to be less than N. Let's say Jane and uh, GMSAW decided that they would run away together. Should any of them receive an encoded message entailing the letter L for let's get out of here, Gilga? The way we would do this is first turn the alphabetical value L into its numerical counterpart, which from this table we would know it would be 12. To encode this, we can use the following formula. C is equal to m to the power of e mod n, or in this case, c is equal to 12 to the power of 5 mod 14, which is just equal to 10. Let's assume that Jane was the one who encoded this message, meaning that she's the sender. After encoding our message, we would get the value of 10, which we would send to that ugly pugly ass Gilgadork. When he gets it, he would then be able to decode it with the private key, which we know is 1114. So here's how that process would look like. When that idiot gets it, when that simpleton gets it, he would use the following decryption formula. C to the power of d mod n. Let's do for him, useless ass brute, we get this after substituting in our values. M is equal to 10 to the power of 11 mod 14 is equal to 12. We get our original message back. Remember 12 was a numerical value of the letter L, which we said would be let's get out of here or something along those lines. Gilgamesh Slayer of Worlds, if he could understand it, bastard, would be able to know that Jane sent the go ahead message and oh. Oh, he's already gone. Can we just appreciate how fucking cool this entire process was? Seriously, let's just take a moment to understand what we just did. A mother fucking loop de loop of math. We just saved two lovebirds through the power of cryptography and mathematics. Oh, it doesn't even matter because the value of n was so small and he picked such small prime numbers.
Look, obviously this isn't secure at all, which is, it's just for demonstration purposes. When we use small numbers like this, it's not secure. So let's look at some more secure examples in real world example. Let's see what a real value of RSA would look like. Okay, let's see. Hmm, RSA 100, huh? Okay, that's quite a bit bigger than our simple ass examples. What, it's been factored already, making it infeasible to use it? Okay, so by that logic, we just use bigger keys, so it's not as easy to crack. What's next? RSA 110, okay. Crack, cracked, cracked, crack. What the fuck? RSA 2048, 617 decimal digits. How? Well, it turns out if you are somehow able to factorize this ginormous number, you could be the recipient of a fresh sum of $200,000. So get on it. What are you waiting for? This value, RSA 2048, this is typically what you see used out right now. Are you happy? You better be fucking happy. You just learned how one of the core crypto systems works on an internal and mathematical level. That's huge. Doesn't matter if we use tiny ass bitch baby numbers. The fact is you are now an RSA master. I seriously urge you to try to encode your own tiny little messages. See if you can do it for bigger messages and try to program an implementation for it. Researching this has been so much fun and so rewarding. We take this crypto stuff for granted, especially in hacking. We sort of just learn about these systems and that they exist, but to understand it on such a deep level really makes you appreciate it and, and fear how powerful our computers are. Wow. Again, please consider checking out our Discord server. It's been so much fun getting to know everyone and talking about stupid shit. I mean, just look at this fucking tree that someone sent thank you guys so much for watching i know this video took a while to get out and it's probably a bit shorter but i'm not going anywhere i plan to make a bunch more of these videos ranging from all different types of topics if you like this kind of video let me know and i'll be sure to cover different things i'm learning while i'm trying to teach everyone you know Feynman's technique and all but i hope you learned something from it and more importantly i hope you enjoyed it thank you once again and until next time goodbye